Welcome back to Documentary First, an inside look at a documentary filmmaker's journey. I'm your host, Jason Rugg, and joining us, as always, is our documentary filmmaker, Christian Taylor. Hey, Jason Rugg. Good to have you here, Christian. Thanks. Great to be here. And I I was thinking, I don't really have a title for Robbie here. You can uh, come up with whatever Robbie, you want. <laughs> yeah, like you're, you're just, you're here now. It's like, okay, per. Producer, He's a but co-host. I don't, I don't know exactly. He, he has now slid into the co-host chair. So, and our other co-host, okay. Robbie Davis. Very nice. So I'll Robbie gets it. to be a co-host. Yes. I had to be a button pushing guy. <laughs> it's all right. I, I, once we log off, I I press many a buttons. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, we're also joined by a name that's probably familiar to a lot of our listeners, uh, Joe Amade. Hello. Yes, indeed. Good to have you here, here. Joe. Uh, Christian, do you want to intro Joe a little bit? I'm going to let Robbie do that. He's done a little bit of research, and uh, Joe, we're so happy to have you here. Robbie, why don't you uh, take it from here? Absolutely. And Joe, if I get anything wrong, please please feel free to correct me. Uh, Give me a good tongue lashing. Um, No, my my name's Bill, though. No, okay. <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> this is all wrong. I'm going to have to go back to the drawing board. Uh, but uh, Joe Amade uh, has enjoyed a film career um, for close to 30 years now. Um, and he, his personal love for independent film and documentaries made its way into the business. Uh, he made his way uh, when he became the president of USA Home Entertainment in uh, 2000. While, and while shepherding films like Steven Soderbergh's Traffic, Spike Jones being John Malkovich – a wild film, uh, Robert Altman's uh, Gosford Park into home entertainment, uh, Joe learned what it took to get these films noticed. Uh, so the when uh, you then started Virgil Films and Entertainment, and under your leadership, um, you've released uh, award-winning films such as Super Size Me, I'm Chris Farley, Restrepo, Glenn Campbell, I'll, uh, I'll Be Me, uh, Forks Over Knives, um, and you're, because of your efforts in producing films, uh, yeah, uh, like uh, you know, Claire, uh, Clarence Clemens. Who do I think I am? Directed by Nick Mead. Um, I mean, your your credits go on and on and on. And, and um, the girl who wore freedom. And and yes, and now the girl who wore freedom. Um, and it. I've never heard of that one. Yeah. <laughs> well, which one is that? Did we uh, have released that. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, I mean, you're just a lover of all things films. Um, and actually, if you wouldn't mind telling, right before we started, you told us. Uh, how you got your start in film. So would you mind for our audience telling them uh, that, that, that story? Sure. Uh, you know, going all the way back to the days of VHS when video first started, I mean, when it really first started, I was fixing sewing machines for a living. I just got out of high school, maybe a couple of years out of high school. And one day I drove past a strip center and I saw a sign being put up called Video Village, and I I had a video recorder that I was taping, using more to tape things off the of TV. It was a huge, it weighed about a ton. It had a wire remote, and, uh, and it was VHS. It was not a Betamax. And so I kind of knew what was going on. You could rent, you could rent tapes through mail order and things like that. So, so I walked into this store, and, you know, they had about 10,000 movies. And to me, it was like walking into heaven because there were so many movies that I had never seen before. So I I joined their membership because that's what it was at the time. You joined their membership. And I was able to take home three movies a night. And every day I went back and rented (laughs) another three movies. And when I would come in, we would discuss the movies that I had seen. And it was very apparent to the manager of that store that I knew more about movies than his entire staff combined, which was not their fault. It's just the way it was. So within a week, I wasn't fixing sewing machines anymore, though I still can. Um, I wasn't fixing sewing machines, and I was working there full time. And to tell you the difference in the business, this is it's so different these days, but the consumer, people would walk into a store, and they would pick up four or five movies, and they would rent them for $5 a night, every night. And we would have lines, literal lines, um, going out the door all night, all day, because this phenomenon was just going absolutely bonkers. 
So one store turned into two stores, two stores, two stores turned into 10 stores. And next thing you know, it, it became an 18 store chain. And I ran that chain. I became the buyer. Um, two, two guys owned the chain. They split up. I ended up working for one of them. And then after a while, I left and started my career uh, on the studio level. And I got a job with a company called IVE, International Video Entertainment. They were owned by Carol Co. So we had the, the Rambo films, the first Rambo films, second uh, Terminator 2. Um, and I hope I, we, we brought, we're responsible for bringing the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Um, oh, a classic. Um, <laughs> Uh, but we also released Reservoir Dogs, a whole bunch of really cool films. And um, but unfortunately, the claim to fame for that company was my boss, my the, who was the CEO, was a gentleman by the name of Jose Menendez. And Jose was married to Kitty Menendez. And then if you don't know, those um, names sound familiar. Yeah. Well, their sons yeah. were Eric and Lyle, who took a shotgun to their parents and murdered them. On a on a Sunday night in the middle of August, um, and everything went crazy after that point. Wow! Very famous, very wow. famous case. Um, well, so it put this all in context. What year was this? What are we talking about? Are we talking about the age of the dinosaurs? Yes, this is, <laughs> is pre Buster Keaton. Um, <laughs> this is uh, the eighties. This is the eighties, late eighties, mid eighties, late eighties. So and, Stranger Things era. Yeah, Stranger <laughs> Things era. Um, for the for our younger audience, if you've only know the eighties from Stranger Things, it's pretty accurate, but that's the era Joe's talking about. There was twenty nine thousand video stores. Wow. Oh my goodness. Twenty nine thousand. It was crazy. So to, yeah, to that, hark- that's unbelievable. Yeah, to harken back to those days, every year there was a, a video convention held in Las Vegas, the Video Software Dealers Association, and retailers from all over the country would attend, and every studio would have a booth. And and I'm not exaggerating this, and I wish I had pictures that I could show you. Paramount <laughs> built a replica of James Cameron's Titanic on the showroom floor. Wait. And Gloria, <laughs> um, the, the actress. Estefan? The actress that was in the movie that played Rose, the older Rose, signed autographs on the yeah. deck of the Titanic. So that wow, would be the gosh. Booth. Then yeah, walk, it's incredible. It, it gets even better. You'd walk <laughs> down the aisle, and there would be the MGM booth. And there would, and I'm not exaggerating, there would be Gene Kelly signing autographs. There would be, and, and that's, it was everywhere. And we would have our own booth, and we had our stars as well. And we could do a whole podcast on incredible, funny, and some not so funny stories about working with the actors and actresses that appeared at, at our booth. Um, crazy days, just, and it lasted about five or six years. And then things started to change and uh, streaming, you know, killed it all. <laughs> well, so you're speeding along here. Uh, <laughs> My head, that was- yeah, I'm saying it. That's what it was like to remember it. It was the 80s. <laughs> You skipped a whole bunch because because when the videos came out, I mean, in the early 80s, let's go back a little bit before that. The only way you could see movies really were you could see them at the movie theater. And of course, it was the, you know, big releases. You would wait for them. They would be advertised at the theaters. You know, you would see movie posters at the theaters or they would be advertised sometimes on TV as it got later into the, you know, late 70s, early 80s. Um, But most all of the movies were on TV. And then there would be old movies that would show on television. So when these VHS tapes began to be released, is this the first time that anybody could just go and choose whatever movie they wanted to watch and that's why it was so big at first? Yes, it it all started with a company um, called Magnetic Video. And Magnetic Video had a deal with 20th Century Fox. So 20th Century Fox put out, I don't know, 30 films, um, Patton, Tora, 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 Von Ryan's Express. Um, and they were that was all that was available because nobody had video recorders. And 
there was a couple different ways of getting to those tapes. But once they saw the result of, of those, you know, really small little group of titles, it blossomed and it blossomed quickly. Then every studio got involved. And, and then video stores started, started to pop up because to make the 20th Century Fox tapes, which I actually still have some, there weren't even video stores at that point. I mean, you know, you would get them at camera stores. Wow. Um, oh, yeah. You would, you would get them wild. at camera stores. Or, oh. or there was a, a, a bunch of stores around the country that rented and sold eight millimeter digests of motion pictures, of films which are very collectible these days. So it would be huh. like an eight minute version of, you know, Camelot or something like that. And it just, you know, people just jumped on board because now you can go and you can take this movie home, one of your favorite films and watch it as many times as you want before you returned it. And those, those VHSs back then cost the video store $69. So it wasn't make. until wow. years later. Yeah, there was no consumer <laughs> collecting or anything at that point. And then Paramount one day said, why don't we release, I think it was Raiders, Raiders of the Lost Ark. Why don't we release it in 1999 and let's see how many people will buy it and own it. And <laughs> everybody bought it and owned it. Well, so yeah, uh, Raiders, wow. what, 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 what is that exactly? <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're here. talking to babies here. We're talking to babies. Yeah. We're yeah. a multi-generational podcast. Hey, I, I think Jason and I can say we're well-educated babies. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. So from VHS, I mean, one question I had is, did the technology with the machines, the players, the VHS player or the DVD player, did that technology come first or did the actual, you know, material, the VHS tapes, or did they develop simultaneously? So, all right, now we're really getting into history. So <laughs> as strange as this is going to sound, okay, in the 50s, late 50s, Bing Crosby, of all people, Bing Crosby videotaped his television specials, okay? In the early 60s, Jerry Lewis perfected p putting a video camera next to his camera when he was making movies so he could instantly see the shot instead of waiting for rushes. These are two pioneers that go somewhat unnoticed. Mo a lot of people know about Jerry Lewis, but most people don't know about Bing Crosby. So there was things being videotaped at all times, but during those same time where Crosby was brilliant is that he kept all the tapes, whereas every other show back then recorded on video and then erased it, mm -hmm. which is why there's no early Johnny Carson shows, no early Red Skelton shows. Some people saved them, but a lot of a lot of people because you know you didn't want to. It was costly, and the tapes were huge. It wasn't like a V, a VHS tape. They were big, these big three quarter inch babies, and um, so they just erased over them. So at that convention that I that I talked to you about every year, they would give a uh, video, like a lifetime a, a video lifetime achievement award, and the very first person to get that award was Bing Crosby, though he was. He had passed at the time, um, and then throughout the years they gave it to everybody from being, you know Bob Hope to J Jimmy Stewart, you know the legends, which was great because being there you get you got to see these people. That for me as a film buff, I was in heaven, and you get in, in, in a lot of cases you got to meet them. I met Jimmy Stewart, and I met Bob Hope. Um, I, there was there's so many people that, and it was just it was a you know a, a wonderful time, and then so VHS one day you know we all you know Sony, and the manufacturers created it you know a disc a DVD, and one day we all got calls saying we have this new format called DVD, um, what do you think? And we all said you're out of your mind, but it took over quickly, <laughs> and. Um, the video store uh, started to go away because now you could buy a DVD for as much as some stores were charging to rent a VHS. So it quickly turned over. 
and the, and the studios for all the people that were collecting VHS, you know, the film collectors, and there were so many of them, especially Disney, everybody had to have every Disney release. Well, all of a sudden, you're rebuying the same movie, only it's a different format. And that's what we're doing now today. Still buying. Now, now they're streaming. Yes. So how did you go from just working in a video store to becoming a distributor? So when I was, in particular, when I was at USA, um, I worked for a gentleman by the name of Scott Greenstein, who at one time was known as the third Weinstein brother. He started with Harvey and Bob. And then he oh, went wow. to run October Films for a little bit, and he ended up at USA. And he taught me, um, he taught me the independent film business. And, and he gave me the, um, he had the trust in me that I could run USA and deal with a lot of the independent filmmakers and not get them angry at us and stuff like that. So I had to prove myself, but I was able to do that. And working with people on their DVD releases with people like Soderbergh and Robert Altman in particular, where I worked with on Gosford Park, who, and I, 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 I'm hoping this resonates with the three of you, um, we were on a, a call with all the powers to be at my company and his folks, and he introduced me to his people as, uh, this is Joe Amaday. I want you all to know he's not a suit. Hmm. <laughs> and that's I was good. like, that's it. I'm done. Robert Altman just said that about me. I'm retiring. <laughs> I'm going home. You know? And 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 that's kind of the way I've always I've always worked. But so I learned the independent film business. I had worked in between that video store. I worked for Jose. You you know what happened there. And I left there and I went to Turner and I worked for Ted Turner for four years. And then Ted Turner sold the company. And so then I went to Polygram and Polygram sold to Universal. And, and then at USA, USA was run by Barry Diller and he sold the company. So it just kept on happening through no fault of our own. I was being you know put out to pasture and I was taken care of by these guys, but I didn't want to do that anymore. So I wrote a, you know, a half-assed business plan. And I actually hit the streets in New York trying to start a new company. And I was very fortunate that within a week, I found people that wanted to put up some money to start a distribution company. And that's kind of, and it was called Heart Sharp. Um, and that year, I was very fortunate that I went to my very first Sundance and heard about a film called Super Size Me, saw it there. Nobody would take it because they were afraid of losing their Happy Meals. Um, and I was like, I'll take it. And, um, I had to, I had to have a meeting with Morgan Spurlock and prove that I could do it. And I met with Morgan and him and I hit it off and became very close friends and we really supersized me. And the next thing I knew, everybody that had a documentary, they couldn't get it picked up by Harvey or Sony classics or Fox searchlight came to us and we started, you know, building a reputation for releasing documentaries. Never was never the plan to do that ever, but we got some really great ones and we we're very fortunate and honored to release films like Restrepo and, and the Glenn Campbell movie. And, um, and then we we've kind of reached our peak and pinnacle with, you know, the girl who wore freedom. I don't know where we're going to go from here. Um, but, uh, <laughs> you know, we just, we just became, you know, you know we, we never moved to LA or we we're just kind of normal folk trying to release, meaningful films and um we've been able to you know move from vhs to dvd from dvd to streaming and now streaming into into uh, transactional and we've been able to pivot we're very good at it um and we have strong relationships with all of the accounts i was that we were the second company to give netflix movies for streaming Wow. Yeah. So I'm very proud of that <laughs> fact and uh, still enjoy a really strong relationship with Netflix. It doesn't mean that they're buying everything that I have, but they're still giving me meetings. Um, so so while we're doing all this, I was constantly getting pitched products to produce, um, you know, put up some money and produce or 
partner with somebody to produce. And, you know, a, a project came my way, which was a documentary on Clarence Clemens, who's Bruce Springsteen's saxophone player. And I am a Springsteen fanatic. And uh, I selfishly have always tried to release movies about people that I really enjoy and like. And um, <laughs> I met with Clarence and he said, you want to do this movie? And I said, yes. He said, you're never, ever, ever, ever going to meet Bruce Springsteen. <laughs> I want you to know that. What a pitch. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so um, I said, that's not why I want to do this movie. I want to do this movie because I love you too. You know, if I don't lose, meet Bruce, I'll, I don't meet Bruce. And we started working on it. He already had the director, Nick Mead and, and Clarence had already, had already made like a 45 minute short on this subject matter. And we signed a contract and I started to work with one of my heroes and uh, four weeks in, he passed away. <gasps> Whoa. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Died oh, of a stroke. Wow. Oh, that's so, so hard. Oh, yeah. Gosh. So Nick and I, you know, we had a choice. We either forget about it or we continue to work and fulfill his dream. And it took about four years. A lot of things happened in between those four years, but we finished it and uh, it was hard it was a lot of it was a nightmare um it didn't make any money and at the end of it all i said to myself i can't wait to do it again <laughs> figure that out i uh i know exactly what you're talking about <laughs> <laughs> so you know and uh, we are going to do it again and uh but uh you know we we uh, i'm very very fortunate um, because I don't do this myself. It'd be great for me to sit here and say, you know, I'm a one man band, but you don't do it yourself. And I have a staff and there's not a lot of us. Um, at, at one time at the heyday of this business, we had 16 people. Now there's four of us. I have the best four people on the face of the earth. Um, and at the top of the list is Tim Maggiani, who's now my, my actual partner in the business and most recently became co-president of Virgil Films. Um, without them, you know, because they do everything. I, I find the films, and I, I'm the first contact with the filmmaker. And But once that's done, as, as, as my good friend Miss Taylor will tell you, I kind of move away and let them do their thing with the knowledge that if they're not doing their thing, the filmmaker has every right to call me right away. But I never hear from the filmmaker. Um, they'll hear more from me when I start sending them money and stuff like that. When, you know, when reporting comes in, but in between it's my staff. Um, and without them, I wouldn't, I wouldn't exist to be honest with you. Uh, so they're the ones that deserve, even on girl who wore freedom, they're the ones that, you know, deserve the, the, the bigger thank you than me. Well, I will. I will say you guys are uh, a bang up team because, in a lot of ways, you are the rainmaker in that you um, are such a, a personable person and you care very deeply. I mean, anybody that's in the documentary business that comes to me and wants to talk about distribution, uh, um, now that I have had two experiences with different companies, um, I know the, the difference and I am able to say beyond a shadow of a doubt, um, if you want to deal with a real person that actually cares about your film and communicates with you and will tell you the truth, uh, then you need to give Virgil Films a call. And it's true, you know, your team and your staff, once you pass us off and that agreement is signed, they step up to the plate and have a plan and usher you through that system in a very professional way. And I have felt um, treated with respect and kindness and open communication uh, from day one. Um, I appreciate so, it. yeah, and so, I mean, yeah. And, and distribution is, you know, the movie business has always been hard. We all, we all know that. And getting a film first, getting a film made is, you know, a lot of people say it's a miracle and I, and, and it is, um, cause it's such hard work and a lot of it is really, you know, gut wrenching at times, um, and trying to get, if you're a filmmaker trying to get your vision, you know, out there with the finished product, you know, the final cut, so to speak, 
is very, very hard. And I appreciate that. And I always have. Um, and I think probably my love of film uh, is probably the reason why, because I've been a film geek lover from as long as I can remember. I mean, from childhood days. And um, so I guess I have a respect for filmmakers that sometimes gets me in trouble, to be honest with you, because um, everyone's <laughs> not Christian Taylor. Um, there's the quite the opposite. You know, Christian had a bad a bad experience with another distributor. And I have had bad, or we, Virgil, has had bad experience with filmmakers that are just, you know, from another planet, to be honest with you. Um, you have to be able to accept the truth of what's happening. And when, you know, certain accounts out there pass on your film, there there's reasons that they're passing on the film. And some filmmakers don't want to accept that. Um, so, you know, and in this world that's distribution business, if you want to move into that area, it's, you know, today, it's probably the worst that ever has been. And that is because of a whole lot of factors. But and some of them are very special factors that will go away. You know, Discovery bought Warner. So it's going to take a year for that to figure itself out. But be, in during that year, HBO Max at one time that was a big buyer, is not going to be buying a whole lot of movies. HBO itself is not going to be buying a whole lot of movies. Um, and all of the Discovery channels, and you know there's a lot of them, are not going to be buying a lot of movies um, or a lot of TV shows until this thing gets set, gets settled. And it's not going to be settled until next year. The most recent casualty is CNN. CNN announced last week no more third-party acquisitions. So I can't even take a film like Girl and present it to CNN. What I can do is um, if if – if Girl is in development, I can present that to CNN, but then CNN just takes it. You don't make it. You know, their in-house people make it. So that's a huge change. And then you got Netflix that every, you know, you, you, they had a good quarter last quarter. Who knows what it's going to be next quarter? Their stock is still not where it was. So all of these things that are happening, and then on top of it, obviously, you have COVID, which is, is you know, all of these companies are half- they're in the office half the week, they're home half the week. That has caused a, a disruption. Everything's happening at the same time. Um, but all of those things are going to iron themselves out. Um, it just is when. And most people are saying to me, end of first quarter, beginning of second quarter. So we've kind of pulled back a little bit from pitching a whole lot of new stuff until then. I'm in constant contact with the buyers. When I talk to them, they say, you know, Hey, if uh, I'm not here in a month, you'll know why. Um, and in some case, excuse me, in some cases that has come true. I'm hoping it doesn't continue to come true, but you just got to flow with it. You know, you got to. So what, what do we do as a distributor? We still have an obligation to make money. We have to make money for the filmmaker. And we have to make money for ourselves. We got to pay our bills. We got to pay us. So we have to do everything we can to bring in dollars any way we can. So we are really pushing for as much transactional and getting the film put up on these sites where it needs to be seen, at least in the first or second week, and then trying to draw people to those sites to, you know, bring in transactional dollars. And then it's very important to continue for the first couple of years and make sure that, um, and we'll use Girl for an example, anything that has to do with veterans or the, or the war or the military, any specials that iTunes puts up, whether it be Veterans Day or Memorial Day or D-Day or anything you're a part of. Um, and, and any subject of any documentary that we release, let's say it's a documentary about somebody fighting cancer, well, there's November is Cancer Month, or you have to make sure that you're on top of all of those things. Um, so someday, you know, one day you might put on iTunes a year from now, and you'll see your movie being rented for 99 cents. And you're like, oh, my God, you're renting my movie for 99 cents. That's because it's a two-week special. It's kind of like when you used to go into Barnes & Noble and see the DVDs, buy one, get one free, or buy one, get 50. We have to make sure that we are involved in all of them specials for at least a couple of years. And that does not happen hmm. um, at other distributors. I'm just going to say that flatly. It does not happen. But we do it because we are as greedy 
as anybody when it comes to making money because we have to. <laughs> I mean, it's, yeah. it's a business, you know? And um, yeah. And when the streamers all pass, this is all you got, you know? So you got to keep on pushing. Um, and that's what we do. Now, I have a question. Uh, sure. So there, there seems to be – there's a lot of – uncertainty a lot of turmoil in the industry now i there's there's a lot of things that seem to like kind of have you at the edge of your seat but in the midst of all that like what what's your favorite part of doing this because like you could i'm sure you could just go oh, i'm gonna pack my bags this has been nice you know i've been told i'm not a suit i'm out uh <laughs> but i mean what what keeps i mean aside from the money what keeps coming keeps you coming back well, I, I live in Bucks County, Pennsylvania. It ain't the money. Oh, sure. It's not the money. <laughs> <laughs> but I've been very fortunate. I put, you know, two kids through college and I have a nice house and I have a wonderful, beautiful wife. So I'm very, very fortunate. Um, but what keeps me going is the mo- is, it's, it's the movies. I mean, some people, you know, have said to me, you know, you know, you're going to retire. Ever thinking about retiring in five years? I'm like, I watch movies for a living. I go to film festivals. I'm going to, I don't pay for, I go to local theaters. I don't pay. Why would I stop doing that? So <laughs> I, I just love film and I love, I don't, it's not just documentaries. I, you know, I, I love Westerns and dramas and war films and foreign films. And I'm a huge silent film fan. It's, it's the, it's the movies because every time you turn on a new film, it is a brand new discovery. So that's, that's what keeps me going. And if you see something, you know, we could pitch a lot of movies. If you see something that really gets to you that you think, well, you, you know what it is? You see it and then you automatically say to yourself, I want to share this with other people. So that means I want to take it and get it out there for other people to see because I do believe that they will enjoy this as much as I did, or in some cases they might even enjoy it better. Um, and that's really what it is, is finding those discoveries and being turned on by them and then getting them out to the market so other people can enjoy them too. And when they do, it's the greatest thing in the world, you know, because a lot of times they don't agree with you at all. <laughs> um, so, you know, it's, yeah, the business itself, um, yeah, at times I've really thought, God, I, don't, I just don't want to do this part of it anymore. Um, but then the next day I put something on or that night I put something on and, and I realize why I'm doing it. All right. So here's my question for you. I've been watching, of course, as you know, and anybody that's listened to our podcast knows that I've been struggling with this whole distribution part of the business, um, you know, since we finally made the final cut of the film. Um, it is something that I never understood. You know, I thought the making of the film was the hardest part. Of course, I've said it a million times for me, looking back over the whole course of it, it's the easiest part. The business part of it, the selling part of it, the distribution part of it is just insanely hard, particularly for right-brained creatives. Um, and I finally, you know, I'm in this wonderful place with, with you guys at Virgil Films, and I finally feel like I can relax and trust uh, this partnership. Um, but as I'm looking for these next film projects that I'm making, I'm looking at this distribution landscape. It looks like a tsunami. Nobody knows how it's going to, to fall out. And from what I'm hearing, you know, the Netflixes, Hulus, Amazon of the world, they are not buying independent films. So let's take the Carenton project that I have coming up or the Brave Dutch, which we envisioned as a documentary uh, series. You know, the word on the street is these streamers aren't up for a documentary series. And I assume I could go and raise the money and make these myself. But let's say I go and raise the money to make the Brave Dutch. And I've got this great documentary series. And I bring it to you, Joe. And it's all packaged up, ready for you to go sell it. Um, you know, at this point, nobody's going to be interested and I really am wondering where is the independent filmmaker going to go, you know, to place their films? 
because it feels very depressing and discouraging mm-hmm. uh, because in the, in the um, AVOD or SVOD model, the only way that we're, our films are ever going to be seen is if advertising dollars are spent, you know, but, but the only place you have to advertise is on the platforms themselves, right? It's not like we can put up a billboard or put something in a magazine. It's just on the sites themselves or on social media. Yeah, um, it's it's. I'm not I'm not gonna lie. It's it's hard, and it is a little. I hate to use the word depressing, but it is a little depressing because of everything that's happening today. The there is a chance. I mean, as a filmmaker, you have to get to a point where if you have a project, and everyone has not shown interest in helping you with that project financially you have to get to a point where you walk away from that project. And the reason being is that let's say you have project A and you put together an incredible development pitch and whether it be a feature film or a, or a series and you take it to everybody, you get it in front of everybody and everybody passes. Well, you're going to go make that unless you make the greatest series of all time or the greatest feature film of all time, you're bringing that back in some cases to the very same people that weren't interested in it in the beginning. So really now you got to get them to like watch it and say, you were wrong. So you, you, you gotta be able to walk away from those projects. And, and it's the same thing with us. You know, at times we've, we've walked away from films that we really liked because we know, we know we can't get them placed. The truth, the bold, hard truth of the matter is, is the streamers and the premium cable folks, you know, the showtimes, are all but done buying licensing third-party product. That's what it feels like. And, And as a distributor that calls on all of those people, it's just not happening. And it's not, it's not that they're not buying independent product. They're not buying any product. And why is that? Can you because is it be- their own? So yeah. so we'll use Netflix as an example. And and I don't this is not knowledge that, you know, I sat down with the folks at Netflix and they told me all of this, but it's very obvious. So you have a company that built this huge, you know, 150 million subscribers that's, you know, billions of dollars are coming in on films that they only have the rights to for 2 years. Okay, so even their greatest rental they only have for two years, unless they renew it. And then one day somebody says, well, why don't we make our own? Then we own them forever. And that started with uh, House of Cards and Orange is the New Black. Um, And it took off. I mean, we all know how much it took off. And they said, all right, let's make more. And then they said, all right, let's not only make our own movies, but let's go find those really prestigious movies that are already done, films that premiere at Toronto or Cannes, and we'll buy them. We'll buy them in all perpetuity, and we will own them. So now they own their own library. So they're worth so much more by owning their own shit, their own stuff, their own movies. Same thing with Apple. Same thing with Hulu. Across the board, same thing with all of them, with the exception of Amazon, because they already have, you know, a million prime subscribers to get free shipping. They're a little bit different, but it's the same with the cable guys. So you can't fight that because it's an unwinnable battle because in reality, they're right to be doing what they're doing as much as I hate it because they don't buy my movies anymore or very few of them. um, I don't blame them for doing it. So then you get into the quality of the movies and that we can talk about all night, but, That's the truth. Um, Whenever you see that word original, that's the reason they're not licensing. They own that movie forever. So what hope can you give the independent filmmaker that, you know, wants to make their films? They're not going to be, you know, part of a studio system. Um, What hope can you give? So the hope, the, what I try to say to filmmakers is, number one, the most important thing is watch your budget. The days of two, three million dollar documentaries that was, you know, 
well, there was the normal, you know, unless you have, you know, you're making a, a documentary on Whitney Houston or, you know, somebody like that, you can't spend that money. You just can't. You're never going to get it back. Uh, so you have to be very careful on what you spend. You know, documentaries can be made for three to five hundred thousand dollars. And over the course of years, you could get that money back. But you have to know um, that. One, a streamer is probably not going to take it, though it should still be pitched to them. Give them the opportunity to say no. I've always said that, you know, they're probably going to say no, but who the heck knows? They might, you know, have a relative or their wife might. I, I give you a, a really good example. So we used to have we used to have these films. We used to do a, a bunch of films with a company called Pure Flix. Pure Flix is a very religious, faith-based film company. They made God's Not Dead. In fact, when they made God's Not Dead, that's when we stopped doing business with them because they got too big for their... But anyway, so we had these movies. And they were faith-based films, uh, Jesus-oriented, but not Sledgehammer. Not, you know, if you don't believe in Jesus, you're going to hell. It wasn't that. It was family-driven films that had a very faith-based... And there was a buyer at Netflix who was not in favor of, I guess the best way to say this, struggling whether or not she should bring in these movies, no matter what I said. And um, she had a meeting with a, I, I, I can't say the name, she had a meeting with someone very, very high up in the management of Netflix. And she explained her struggles to this person. And this person said, my sister is a born again Christian. So she will rent this movie. And there's millions of faith, uh, faith based pe people that believe in their believe strongly in their faith that will rent this movie. You can't shut this out because of your own convictions. And she brought in the films. So you, th that's what I meant by you. You, you never stop trying. The, the day that I will stop pitching to Netflix is the day that they say to me, Joe, stop pitching. That's when I'm going to stop. Same thing with every account. As long as they let me in the mm -hmm. door, as long as they let me pitch, whether the film is a 45-minute short documentary or a two-hour horror movie, I'm going to pitch them and give them the opportunity to say no. Because <laughs> they might say yes one of these times. But that you know, being said, the filmmaker, the filmmaker has to be very careful on what they spend. And in some cases, the filmmaker should be saying to themselves, it's going to take me three years to make my money back. And it's all going to be transactional. And maybe in year two or three, gosh knows something else might come up. A new SVOD company or or Netflix's AVOD sect, you know, thing that they just launched will skyrocket. And they want more movies. You never know when that kind of thing can happen. But if you go spend seven, eight hundred grand on a on a a doc that is not a sensational story or something like that, um, you're going to be in trouble. So let's talk about how the money works for the independent filmmaker. So as I understand it, you know, the way that it used to work was that you know the distributor would take a title would go to whoever, the cable or the streamers, they would do a deal, whether it was, you know, two to five years for the rights, they would get paid a lump sum and everybody would share a piece of that. Well, that obviously, you know, exists only in small, you know, chances now. And so we are on this AVOD, SVOD, you know, track. The way that I understand it is that the movie goes up on the streaming services for whatever the price is. The streamers then, let's say we, we pay $4.99 to rent, $9.99 to buy. The streamers then take a portion of that, right? A portion of that goes to distributors and a portion of that goes to pay the bills. And that ultimately what a, a percentage goes to the independent filmmaker. Yeah. So, so yeah. Yeah. So yeah. 
and then over the course of the time, over course of time, like I, I already know that takes a long time for that, for a check to even come. Right. What can filmmakers expect? So we'll use Amazon. We'll just use that because everybody knows Amazon. So you put a movie up on the Amazon site and that distributor has a deal, their own deal with Amazon. Amazon or any account can dictate what the pricing is. We are not allowed to tell Amazon how much to rent a movie for. We're not allowed to tell any account. It's against the law. We do have a suggested retail price, and we suggest to them it should be $9.99 or $12.99. But if they want to rent it for $1.99, they can. But they're still going to pay me my cut of the suggested retail price. So let's just say, for example, my cut is 50-50. And this is just an example. I'm not saying my cut is 50-50. And it's $12.99. So that's, you know, we make $6.50 every time it's rented or every time it's bought. That $6.50 gets paid to me. And whatever deal I have with the filmmaker, which could be anywhere, whatever percentage that is, um, I take my percentage of that. But I also take my cost. I also get my cost back of what it costs me to put that up on Amazon. And by the way, let me just say, I know that there are costs associated because I have had your team working very hard to make sure, you know, that all of my deliverables are given to the streamer. Um, And there's a lot of those and they have to make sure that it's packaged just right. They have to put advertising things together and packages together. And then they have to, you know, I know this week your team was making social squares, you know, to help me put out, um, you know, to to sell the movie. So your team is working hard. There are costs involved. Um, It's, you know, so there are legitimate costs. Just want to say that for filmmakers that are listening. Yeah, we try to keep those costs at a minimum. Um, you you know, there are some distributors out there that, you know, I've looked at sales or sales statements and they're twenty, thirty thousand dollars in marketing and social media costs. And um, I have no idea where you're spending anybody spending twenty thousand dollars in social media costs or marketing costs. Because as you just said, Christian, there's nowhere to advertise anymore. There's no magazine, there's no print. You're not gonna do TV. Nobody listens to regular radio anymore. So it's all social media. And how many ads can you put up on Twitter and Facebook? And even when you do, they don't cost a lot of money, you know? So, you know, our costs are are minimal at this point, um, which also makes it very, very hard because when you put the movie up on any of these accounts, you got to let people know it's available. And next to our friends and family, it's really hard to get the world to know. And that's why we try to partner up with the filmmaker because the filmmaker knows a lot more about the background and the history of the film than we do. You know, we've seen it. They've lived it for years. Um, Well, and I I will say our model has been very helpful um, in that I am continuing to do the screenings for people. I mean, Joe, I got to tell you, and this is part of my film update. I'll get this in really quickly. Our release could not have come at a better time. So our release came on November 1st, which is as we're recording on November 7th. It was a week ago. Um, On November 1st, I was in New York City with 250 high school kids at the French Institute. I did a a screening with them and a QA, and a and it was unbelievable. Like the kids responded in such a a curious, warm, excited way. And, you know, I had several of them come up to me afterwards saying their grandparents fought in World War II and now they were going to go and ask them questions and they wanted their parents to see the film. Um, On the second, I was at a screening in Atlanta at UPS that was sponsored by Delta. And I was able to say, and you can go home and tell your friends and family to watch this on Amazon or Apple TV or Voodoo. I'm going to be at the French embassy with hundreds of people on Thursday night and be able to tell them the same thing. I mean, I'm going to get emotional saying this to you, Joe, but I am just so incredibly thankful that I can show this film to people. They have an emotional response and right away I can say, and you can go home and show it to your friends and family because it's on Amazon. Yeah. It's huge. Now you know why I want to, now you know why I continue to do this. Yeah. 
And and think about how many people you're touching. Yeah. Like, especially with a movie like ours, like I could tell you stories to the end of time about people that are touched and moved. And it does make a difference. You know, film is important to change people's hearts and minds. And you are in an important business, especially for people like me. So I thank you for not leaving. No, I, 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 I appreciate that. Listen, there's a point in all of our careers where, you know, we decide maybe we'll go make serial killer movies and make a lot of money and live in very big houses. Um, or we, we try to release meaningful projects that could actually help people or change people. And I've come to realize that you can't, you know, you, you can do that and, and you can do that um, as long as every once in a while, you know, you have a good horror movie or something else <laughs> like that. But, um, you know, we, you know, films can change people, it, it, not, not just docs, but narratives of, as well. I mean, Grapes of Wrath, when I saw it as a teenager, changed my entire view on things. Um, you know, films can really get to you, even even things like It's a Wonderful Life that is now kind of like a Christmas movie, but really wasn't a Christmas movie. Um, but it did teach me to value a friendship um, when I was a kid. So films can do that. And docs in particular can do that. So, By the way, uh, It's a Wonderful Life, directed by Robert Capra, uh, who was a World War II filmmaker. Right. Frank. Uh, Frank, and it was one of the first, first Frank, Frank. Yeah. Sorry. Thank you. Frank. It was one of the first movies he made after the war. Uh, it actually was the movie he made after the war. And he yeah. started a company called Liberty films. He, so he came back from the war and he enlisted, uh, William Wyler. Right. Capra, um, and two other directors to join him in the creation of Liberty films. And it's wonderful. Was it George was Stevens? Movie. George was Stevens George- was one. Yeah. And it's wonderful life tanked. Didn't didn't make yeah, any money. It did. And it, it tanked did. Liberty Films. Yeah. Yeah. And if you have not uh watched uh Five Came Back, oh, uh do do watch Five Something. Came Back. If you've never watched um Best Years of Our Lives by William Wyler. Uh, it's another phenomenal movie uh, that William Wyler made right after the war. Uh, he won an Oscar for that, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, all right. Well, you know, we I could sit here and talk to you forever, Joe. You're yeah. going to have to come back. <laughs> uh, I do want to, yeah. yeah, I do want to give Robbie and Jason a moment to ask a question before we move into our next segment. So, sure. Jason. Yeah. Yeah, I actually had one. Um, we kind of touched a little bit on AVOD. Um, I'm curious what your perspective on AVOD is for the future, like kind of where it's been and where it's going. So I, what do you I, think about it? I, I love it. Um, you know, for all the all the all the uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, all the nice things that people have said about me throughout my career. What they don't realize is that I really know nothing. Um, I'm, I'm the guy that got the phone call from Ted Sarandis running Netflix saying, I need a hundred movies. And I said, for what? And he explained to me what streaming was. And I, I to be honest with you. I said to him, Ted, I've known you for a long time. You're out of your mind. No one is ever going to watch a movie on their computer, but you can have the hundred movies. So that, so that being said, when Avod started, it was really started with Pluto and then Tubi, they came to us and they said, we want your movies. And I said, nobody's going to watch movies with commercials. We, we, I spent my entire life waiting for cable TV so we didn't have to watch commercials. <laughs> well, anybody under the age of 35, they don't care because they don't want to spend 20 bucks a month. So all of a sudden, Tubi and Pluto within a year have over 60 million, 70 million members. And it's working. That's the one part of the business that we see growth growth in. And now they're looking for originals. And now they're looking to expand their – and Tubi in particular, by the way, really loves documentaries. Pluto, not so much. Tubi really loves documentaries. So um, I love it. Will I watch it as a consumer? Never. But will my children <laughs> – will, will my daughter watch it? All the time. You know, <laughs> well, I mean, I think they've grown up on YouTube, right? Yes. And they are so accustomed to so used to it. Yeah. yeah, 
They're yeah. used to it, so they don't care. And you and I couldn't wait for the DVR so we could either skip, you know, so we could skip the commercials altogether. <laughs> yeah. It's a I, crazy I'm world we live in. I'm trying to figure out a way to scan through the darn ad, you know, and now you get the timer, <laughs> 30 seconds for the ad. I'm like, why am I, you know? But, but think about it. Hulu? So when Hulu first started, it was ad-driven. You get a piece of the ads. Mm-hmm. But now, what, so what we have today, we have Hulu. We have Netflix, we have Disney, um, Peacock. They all have their own AVOD divisions. Well, there's a reason for that. So, yes, I love AVOD, and I think it's it's going to be an even bigger part of the independent <laughs> film's future. But basically, we're just going back to the cable model. I mean, it's, it's, it's just crazy. It's just not in a cable box. And now it's not going to be Comcast or whatever. It's Netflix. It, it, they're going to begin to, I think, congeal like they already are. The These big streaming platforms are going to congeal. And we're just going to have another studio system. And it's just going to be another cable system. It's just that it's going to be streaming. Yeah. And um, also, if you go to Barnes & Noble right now, their DVD div- their DVD sections are all albums. Really? Because hmm. oh, the vinyl yeah. is coming back. Oh, no. Vinyl is, there's, vinyl is outselling CDs by three to one hmm. at this point. Hmm. So, yeah. So, I, I don't I, – I'd be the first to say I do not understand it. But I will also be the first to say I welcome it because it's bringing in revenue. All of a sudden, these two accounts that, you know, we're not bringing in anything to us are now sending us checks. And I'm not going to complain about that. Yeah. Good question, Jason. Got another one? Rob, you got one? Oh, there's so many areas and places to go with this conversation. (laughs) Um, I think – as you see, a thing that I think a lot about uh, is you have so many franchises out, so many sequels, so many, you know, but where is it that you're seeing the most creativity coming out of in the industry right now? Oh, hundred percent independent filmmakers. Um, it, it bothers me to no end when I see a really good filmmaker that's made some really strong films and doesn't necessarily have to be a, an independent filmmaker, but even a well-known filmmaker. And then I pick up the trades and I read it. They're now going to direct Avengers five. And that goes the same <laughs> thing for actors as well. Yeah. Now, again, I get it because they're getting paid a gazillion dollars to do this. So go make one. Don't make, you know, a, a ton. Um, but I do, I still see, a lot of creativity coming out of uh, coming out of, and do you see that? Do you see an end to uh, you know? It's called the Avengers model. Do you see that coming to an end anytime soon? Because it, it 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 makes a lot of money, but yeah. is there a, a, uh, is there an oversaturation point? Is there a point where there's nowhere else to go with it? Like, what where do you see this going? It'll be interesting because you know we've always had movie franchises. I mean, all the way back to Tarzan. You know, we had multiple Tarzans throughout the year, years, and we, we're now experiencing it with something like James Bond that has yet to be has yet to fail generation after generation after generation. But this oversaturation of Marvel, I, I think it's going to be around, and I think it's going to be continue to be big until that next generation comes comes along, and they don't really care about mm-hmm. the Avengers, or they don't really care about you know Doctor Strange because they didn't grow up with it. And, but that's that's 10 years away. So um, I keep saying I'm going to stop asking you questions, but uh, <laughs> I can't help it. I have your attention. Um, so what I wonder is, right now, it's very confusing, I think, for a consumer of, who loves independent film and who loves documentaries to figure out where to go to find what they're interested in. So how can we or how is someone, a from the consumer point of view, if I'm a documentary filmmaker or lover or I'm an independent film lover, how am I going to know where to go to find my films? You know, you're, the thing is that everybody is carrying your film. So it isn't like your film's only available on one or two sites. All of the normal you know, 99 and 910% of the accounts out there that offer films, your film is on. Yes, there's a very small 
I don't want to say insignificant because nobody's insignificant, but there's some documentary sites out there that will probably find you someday and say, would you put your film up on our site? And as you've already experienced, there's a cost to put the film up on the site. And even if that cost is minimal, you never make it back because nobody is going to those sites. The average consumer only wants to put their credit card on to so many sites. So it's or they already have it on Amazon. And they already probably have it on Apple. They're not going to go put it on too many other places to watch movies because you, you have to give them your information. So that's why Amazon and Apple, to a certain extent, are the two leading places for, you know, watching movies. Um, well, that makes sense. What I want to know is most distributors – were cut out of that Amazon thing. So I was told that Amazon was telling distributors, you can no longer have a platform to put up your films, but that wasn't true for you. What kind of magic you know, did I, I you have? I would love to comment on that, <laughs> um, but I can't. Um, my partner, Tim, would kill me, but no, we can put movies up on Amazon. That's the best that I can answer that. All right. Well, I think it is time to move into our DocuView Deja Vu segment. So welcome to DocuView Deja Vu. <laughs> DocuView Deja Vu. Everybody All right. That is, but go ahead. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> that is our segment. That's, we talk about that's our documentary. Yeah, that's our segment, Joe, where we talk about documentaries we've watched. Um, we oh. don't necessarily have to recommend them, but uh, sure. but in this case, you know, we usually do. We like them. So, Jason, I'm going to start with you. We haven't heard you talk enough. Did you come with something? <laughs> yes, I did. Um, so, this is actually a video essay on YouTube about experimental documentaries. Hmm. It's a very interesting uh, little piece. It's 18 minutes long and it breaks down a bunch of different uh, histories of experimental documentaries and how we got here. So the video is called uh, Why You Should Watch Experimental Docs by Thomas Flight. And uh, in it, he breaks down um, kind of the history of like how uh, reality TV got started through documentary filmmaking in, in France in the hmm. early days and um, he talks about Werner Herzog and these films that kind of help you experience humanity without any dialogue. It's a very fascinating mm. little piece. And he talks about a ton of individual docs in it that you can go find other places. Um, so yeah, highly recommend it. Um, if you're interested in looking beyond your traditional documentaries and into more of the experimental kind of fringe ones. Awesome. Very interesting. Thanks, Jason. All right, Robbie, you're up. Uh, so I watched, uh, called, it's called Closed for the Storm or Closed for Storm. Came out in 2020, uh, and it's on Amazon if anybody's interested in, in looking it up. Uh, and it's all about, uh, Jazzland, which is in New Orleans or was in New Orleans. It became Six Flags New Orleans. Um, and a, only a year or two after Six Flags New Orleans opened up, uh, Katrina hit. And, you know, there's, Closed for storm, a sign which oh, everybody goes, oh, well, it'll open up again. Uh, but the damage that was done, um, you know, it's just they couldn't get people back to work in the park as well. It's just this fascinating look at uh, Jazzland was something that was supposed to be iconic. And, you know, people are already coming to New Orleans. Um, but it was something where you'd come to New Orleans and go to an amusement park. Um, and it's almost like this weird, f you know, it's, it's sad because it's a failed – experiment. Um, but it's also fascinating because I mean, being in Mississippi, um, and only what I think it's like five, six hours from new Orleans. Um, there is something quick tangent, um, for me growing up in New Jersey, nine 11 was very real. Um, but, uh, uh, Katrina, because it happened, you know, a world away, I was like, Oh yeah, that was a thing that happened over there. I moved to Mississippi uh, and it's the exact opposite. People are going, oh, 9-11. Yeah, that was a thing that happened over there. And everybody re everybody remembers Katrina. So th it's this fascinating. So that's also why, for some reason, we talk a lot about that, um, like Katrina and all that. And so th I found this documentary. I was like, oh, this is you know more context for the people that I'm living around. Wow, that's yeah. awesome. Yeah. All right, Joe, I'm going to let you go last. Uh, I'm going to come up with uh, with mine right now. So I watched this last week. It was a fascinating documentary. Uh, it's called Travel and Ban, Credence Clearwater Revival at the Royal Albert Town Hall, featuring never-before-seen uh, 
concert footage and narration by Jeff Bridges. Uh, the documentary oh. explores CCR's humble origins and meteoric rise. Uh, it is on Netflix. And I'll just say, as I was watching it, I was I didn't I like CCR. I knew about them. I knew nothing of their history at all. So I came into the documentary just learning about them completely and I fell in love with them. I mean, in the beginning you're following them on this, you know, journey and they're just like little kids. They're so excited. They've known each other since junior high and they seem like wonderful friends and so you just have this warm feeling as you're watching this movie about how happy this is. They weren't into drugs. They weren't uh, you know, they were all getting along. And the second half of the film is actually you're watching the live concert at Royal Albert Hall. And what was crazy about that is they never talked in between songs. It was just, <laughs> they're just up there playing music as if they were in their garage. It was very different. There were no lights and, you know, things, but it was just fascinating to watch them. While I was listening to the concert, though, and I would not recommend this if you don't know CCR, is I started Googling their history and what happened, and I became very disillusioned or sad uh, that it did not end up as happy as it all seemed in the beginning, but it was a fascinating documentary. Jeff Bridges did a phenomenal job narrating it, and I loved learning about a new band, so that's my pick for this week. Wow. Wow. All right, Joe, um, you're up. Probably it would be uh, the Sydney Portier doc um, that's currently available on Apple. Mm. I was fortunate to see it in Toronto. And, you know, normally when you see a doc based on a celebrity, a very well-known celebrity, you know, it's rare that you find anything new. Because you think, you know, especially in the case of Sydney Portier, his story has been told so many so many times, so many different ways. And yeah. he was current and available for interviews and, um, but there were some things that that threw me off that, you know, made me smile um, and things that didn't change my mind on Sydney because my my uh, my love for him and his career and what he stood for um, ha has always been there since I was a kid. But it was very enjoyable and very true to a certain extent. Um, and he dealt with the thing that I liked the best about it is he dealt a lot of it is interviews that he did about five or six years ago, and he deals straightforward with the, you know, the Uncle Tomishness that he was called out for um, while he was still walking with Martin Luther King and appearing with Malcolm X and doing things that everybody else was doing, but because he refused to take roles that he felt diminished the African-American man, and in particular, his role in Guess Who's Coming to Dinner, with I thought helped, you know, the, 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 the problem, but a lot of African-Americans thought it set it back. Um, very enjoyable, uh, fun to watch, and, uh, you know, good to trace the, the life of a real cinema hero that's also, an, you know, an American hero. And so what's the title of the film? Sydney. Sydney. And it's on Apple TV. It's on Apple TV. Yeah. Awesome. All right. So those are some strong rep recommendations for this week. Thank you, guys. Yeah, you're welcome. All right. Well, we are going to have to have you back, but I think, um, well, let me just wrap up real quick and say uh, this has been a humdinger of a week. Uh, I am still in Washington, D.C. I have another week to go. I'm super excited that my son Jonah is being shipped back to the United States tomorrow and I get to pick him up at BWI. He's going to be in uniform for my screening at wow. um, the French Embassy, so I'm super nice. happy about that. Um, wow. this, this, I th think this week, there's been this unbelievable kismet that's kind of come together that we are really enjoying. And it sort of went like this. I made this movie, The Girl Who Wore Freedom. And the main theme of that movie is um, how we express our gratitude to those who laid down their lives and sacrificed for us. And we encourage people to not just say thank you for your service, but to do things, to go beyond that, to show um, service members um, how much, and veterans, how much we appreciate them. When Virginie Durer of Delta Airlines, who is from Normandy, saw the film, 
completely changed her um, in the fact that she's been trying to tell everyone in America what's been happening at Normandy and how much Normans love the Americans. But she never really had a microphone with which to do it or a megaphone um, until she discovered our film. And so once she discovered that and she realized that she worked for Delta Airlines, um, she was very hopeful that she could use that platform to be able to to share the film with everyone. It was so convenient that David Chapman, who's the senior military attache at the U.S. Embassy in Paris in our film, after he retired from the military, he started to work for Michelin. Michelin happened to be one of Virginie's sales accounts. So what that meant is Virginie could partner with Michelin and David in order to do these screenings. So we started this a couple of years ago where we did uh, a thing at Delta. Uh, and then Virginie's mind just kept turning and she began to think about how she could go a little further. And she really began pushing for a charter uh, that would take World War II veterans over to Normandy, uh, which, of course, as everyone knows, we did this past June by partnering with the Best Defense Foundation. So the Best Defense Foundation is now doing everything that we encourage people to do in our movie, you know, and so is Virginie, so is Delta Airlines, and now so is UPS. And so because of this, these relationships that came together this way, now we're sort of on this speaking tour. We've done this with Christian, David Chapman, Virginie Durr, and um, Donnie Edwards, who used to be uh, an NFL player for the San Diego Chargers and for the Kansas City Chiefs. Uh, he now runs this veterans organization. And so we've been on these Q&A panels together to demonstrate um, the power of what a movie can do. Uh, so it's just... It's just been an amazing experience this week. I love that it's, you know, coincided with the release of our film. Joe, hopefully we'll see it in the numbers at some point. Yeah, I hope so. You know, hopefully it's we wonderful. will. It's wonderful news. Yeah. All right, Jason, why don't you take us out? We're way over time. <laughs> well, all right. <laughs> Thank you all for listening to Documentary First, where we believe everyone has a story to tell and you can be the one to tell it. Yes, you can. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody.